This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. My guest today on Sports Files is Carolina Panthers tailback and former Memphis Tigers great D'Angelo Williams. There are some people you simply recognize by one name. There's Madonna, Prince, Beyonce, just to name a few. And in the Memphis area, there's D'Angelo. Everyone remotely associated with the University of Memphis knows D'Angelo Williams and knows his importance to Tigers athletics. He is the most decorated football player to ever play for Memphis and is fourth on the NCAA all-time career rushing list. D'Angelo has gained nearly 6,000 yards in his NFL career and doesn't seem to be slowing down. Today, the former Tiger and current Panther on his love for the two teams and his commitment to both. Next on Sports Files. Hey, D'Angelo, great to see you, man. Great to see you, too, man. Thanks for, for being with us today. Seven years now in the NFL. Has it gone quickly or is it slow? How's the process been? I was just thinking about this the other day. It's been a fast process, but a slow process, kind of one and the same because, you know, when you're going through, you're like, oh, my God, this is taking forever. And then you look back and you're like, you've already banged out seven already. So I have another three years on my contract. I think they say the life expectancy, if you will, the running back in the National Football League over the course of time, it's like three or four years. You've already had seven. You seem relatively healthy. How much longer can you go? I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how many years I want to put in or how long the body's going to hold up, but I kind of owe all that credit to the preparation I had uh, going through Memphis because, uh, you know, Coach West, when he was the head coach here, uh, we did a lot in, in preservating the body, and, mm -hmm. and I kind of carried over in the National Football League. And, you know, it kind of helps when you got another running back back there to take off that, uh, that added pressure. And you're talking about, of course, Jonathan Stewart. You're closing in on 6,000 career yards, 43 touchdowns. You have another six, I believe, receiving. How would you grade yourself on your career to date through seven years? Um, in my mind, I'll give myself a C plus, but mm. with the opportunities that I've gotten, I'll give myself a, a A minus or a B plus because I, had, I hadn't gotten many opportunities uh, uh, and the offense that we're in now with the two years that I've, I've been there. So it could have obviously been more, but, you know, you got to make the best of the opportunities that you get. You know, I'm not complaining by no stretch, but, you know, had I got more opportunities, in my mind, that C would have been a, a A. Yeah, let's talk about that. You average 4.9 yards per carry. So you're nearly five yards per carry. That's one of the best per carry averages in the history of the NFL. I'm talking all running backs. I don't get it. I mean, why are you not getting more carries? And you're a loyal guy. You're loyal to Carolina. You don't complain a lot. But have you ever gone to the coaching staff or the GM and say, listen, I need some more totes? No, I, I kind of, you know, I, I stick with the, the motto of coaches, coach, players, play. And, you know, if they call my number, I try to make the best of it. If they don't call my number, you know, I try to find work elsewhere if it's not blocking or, or uh, stepping my receiving game up or route running, if you will. But, you know, it, it kind of goes back to, you know, like I said, making the best of your opportunities. I, with Jonathan back there, with him being a playmaker as well, and having a playmaker now with Cam Newton, a quarterback, when he can do things with his legs, and then having the receiving core that we have, you know, there's only one football on the field, but there's seven or eight playmakers on the field. So them trying to spread the ball around, and by the time we get back to me, you know, it's not much left. Speaking of making the most of the, uh, of the opportunities you get, Last game against New Orleans, yeah. 210 yards. Yeah. You really showcased your skills. Talk about having that type of a game and also having that type of a game to end the season to get ready for the next year. Well, I, I put all that on the old line back. Uh, they did a great job going in because, uh, you know, New Orleans is hard to win in the Superdome. And, um, you know, we went down and, I mean, we didn't put a spanking on them, but we did, you know, rush for a bunch of yards. And uh, it was... I've had a lot of fun in the Superdome field, playing Tulane back in college, right. uh, going up there every year, and, and, and just having fun. 
and to go out the way that we went out with all the trade speculation and them releasing me at the end of the season and with Jonathan being hurt and allowing me to be that feature back for the last three or four games, you know, there's, there's no pressure on you at all. So I just went out and I played my game, you know, and it's not like I, I did anything different, but as I said before, you know, I got more opportunities and it gave me more opportunities to showcase my talent. You mentioned the offensive line. We remember all those interviews we yeah. did back in college. You always had an O lineman or two with you. Right. You still do that in the NFL? They want to no, interview they you? Don't. No, they don't. No, you don't bring an O lineman over? No, they don't. Uh, they actually interview those guys first. <laughs> we have a, a, a rushing performance like that. They run to the O line and the O line's not too quick to get out of there. You know, in college, they rarely ever get interviewed, no matter how many yards you rush for but they want to hear from everybody because, you know, the O-line is where, you know, a lot of the money is made. You sure. know, those guys play 15, 16 years up there because uh, the life expectancy is a lot higher at that position than probably any other position on the field. So they get just as much air time as we do. They actually have more to say than we do, too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they have more to say than you do. <laughs> okay, here's the speculation. You've obviously heard the speculation about your future in Carolina. Can they afford to keep you and Jonathan Stewart? Will they do that? Will they release you? What information can you give us right now at this time? Well, I heard via Twitter. Uh, via Twitter? That, via Twitter. So you know yeah. it's official. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's the official. <laughs> it's via Twitter. Uh, a bunch of my followers were tweeting me saying that uh, they heard that the new GM said that uh, I was in his plans to, for, I was in their plans to keep me. Well, my thing is, is I've never really thought about it. I just know it's not like my career is in jeopardy. It's just... It, will it, it be in Carolina? Or well, yeah. Right, it's just will, will it be in Carolina or not. But I can tell you this much, whether it's in Carolina or any other 31 of the teams, uh, they're going to get a hard working running back and a, and a guy that, that plays a game with a chip on the shoulder. You're also as loyal as you could be. I mean, there's other guys that may have left for possibly more money or a better opportunity to win in the postseason. You like Carolina, you like being there, and that loyalty stands out. Well, it's, it's kind of one of those things where, you know, Carolina, they gave me my first opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they picked me at 27, and, you know, it was 26 other teams that, that thought I didn't fit their, their style of play. Right. So, I mean, they was loyal to me in that aspect. But I know that as you get older, you find out that this is a business, that it's not just football. Uh, a lot of people think that there's more politics in, um, in college sports than it is in, in professional sports, mm -hmm. but I beg to differ. <laughs> I beg to differ. But um, it, it just all comes down to, you know, just being loyal to the one that gave you your opportunity. And, you know, so far they've been loyal to me, but at the at the point they give me the ax because it's going to be at some point. You know, right, right. My loyalty is going to go with me to some other team. I'm not surprised that you're big in the social media. And Twitter. Yeah. Talk about that with your followers. You have fun it, talking, conversing with them. I do. I. Uh, it's uh, it's funny because this interview kind of spun out from Twitter, but right. Uh, yeah, I, it took me a while to get on Twitter, and uh, once I got on, it's fun. You know, I I get harassed by fans, but I mean I harass them back, so <laughs> it's no big deal. You know, when I'm on Twitter, I'm not I'm not playing the celebrity or or uh, playing the big shot guy, you know, I'm just going, I'm going to shoot you straight. You say something about me that's not right, I'm going to say something about you that's not right. And, uh, you know, it's fun, you know, you get a lot of social media uh, uh, thugs, if you will, mm -hmm. that, that come on and say what they want to say and they hide behind that computer screen or that smartphone. But it, it's fun, though, it's, it's all in good fun. It's, it's fun how, uh, you know, some of the fans, you know, they come, they, they help you out sometime, and then sometimes they're like, hey, you know, he might be right. You right, know? right. It mostly stems from fantasy owners, though, man. I, I was just going to bring that it, up. It all stems from fantasy owners, man. They, they get all upset, like, I drafted me, and it wasn't me that drafted me. It was them. So I just boil it down to bad coaching. Do you accept, uh, appreciate, or have a problem with fantasy football? It's it's a double-edged sword. It's grown the game by leaps and bounds as far as uh, the numbers is uh, viewed because... You mean the interest? Want, yeah, the yeah. interest because they want to see, you know, if this player uh, maxed out his potential and got the m X amount of points to right. win in a certain game. You know, it's women, children, and men alike. You know, everybody's all involved now where it used to be a guy 
watching TV with his son, and the wife walks back and forth in front of the TV, barking out instructions, and he's just like, hey, I'm watching the game here. Right. You know, it, it, it went from that to all of them sitting down watching the game together. So, I mean, that's the good part about it. The bad part about it is, is like, they, there's so many avenues to reach out to your favorite player or this player that you drafted in fantasy football, and they kind of express their dislike and their performance for that week. All right, let's talk a little bit about your alma mater, University of Memphis. Mm -hmm. You've given money, you've given time. It's very, very important to you. It's still very important to you. Very, very important. Uh, this whole thing kicked off through the University of Memphis. You know, when Randy Feechner sat down in my living room, who's now with the Steelers, and he told me, you know, you can come to this university and you can, you can make some things happen. And then Coach West said right behind him, he said, I'm not saying that you're going to come in and you're going to start, but you can make a difference at this level and, you know, you can get significant playing time, you know, and, and that's where, you know, I kind of evolved from is that conversation because at that time Memphis hadn't been to a bowl game in 32 years mm -hmm. and he could have sold me, you know, dreams and hopes and all sort of stuff, but he didn't. I mean, he told me the truth. And, and I love that in him when other colleges sat there and told me, hey, you know, you're going to be the starter and you're going to be this, you're going to be that. And I remember vaguely one school coming in saying that, you know, you would make a great DB. And I was like, DB? Did you see the last game? The last right. guy had 326 yards on me and six touchdowns. <laughs> and you want me to play defensive back? <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, it started here at the University of Memphis, and I, I'm always in debt to the university. You're the perfect example for coaches, whether it's Justin Fuente or coaches moving forward, to sell to recruits. The perfect example of a guy who could have went somewhere else, could have went and yeah. played in the SEC, played in Memphis, went on to the NFL, and has put together an incredible career, that it can be done at any school in any program. Yeah, whenever, whenever I talk to people, like you, if you if you watch Monday Night Football or you watch Sunday Night Football, if you watch those football, uh, those games where they're at prime time, and you hear these people announce their university, I mean, it's just as many guys from the SEC as it is from the Troys or the University of Memphis, these mid-level or, or lower-tier schools, if mm -hmm. you will, mm -hmm. uh, by media representation, not by mine, because right. I think Memphis is a big-time program. And, I mean, I know Coach Fuente is going to get this program back on track. We won three in a row there at the end. I keep close attention to the football. You sure do. Yeah, I do. I even went to the game out in Duke. Uh, I sat there for the whole game, and, you know, I had opportunity to talk to Coach Cutcliffe because he recruited me at Ole Miss when he was the head coach there. So all comes around. At, yeah, it all comes around, you know, and he was just like, hey, man, you know. And I was like, I didn't know you was over here. But, you know, I got a chance to talk to the team and some of the players and stuff to see how, uh, you know, everything was going on the team. And, and I told them, I said, you know, this the money that I'm donating is – it's not for, uh, you know, anybody else but this locker room because I remember sitting in here as a student athlete thinking, man, you know, it would be nice if we had some TVs or if we could just stay over here a little bit longer and hang out. So coming from a student athlete that's been in that position before, I kind of knew the needs of the, the players that were currently there now. The Big East, I don't know how much you've been following this, but Memphis – Obviously, you know, East, is yeah. going to the Big East. It's yeah. not going to be the Big East that, that we know from before. Right. But still, I would imagine you think this is a, a major step up for the University of Memphis, especially the football. The basketball is going to be fine no matter what. But for right. the football, more it's, exposure. It's huge. It's huge. Uh, we needed the exposure. I mean, we got plenty of exposure when I was here. but uh, And then we went to another bowl game thereafter. And uh, we're, we're getting there. I know we're getting there. It's, uh, you know, we just got to stick to a coach because, you know, we can't keep – uh, firing coaches left and right because, you know, they get their guys in here different offensive system. You know, it takes three or four years to get a program turned around because, you know, you're still dealing with the, the kids that were there before that don't quite fit your system. Right. But they have to go through the system because they were a scholarship player. So it's, it's kind of one of those things to where, you know, we as a university have to believe in the coach that we sign and hold them to his contract instead of cutting them out early. Out of all the great accomplishments that uh, you produced at Memphis on the field, what's the one single greatest accomplishment in your opinion? You broke all kinds of records. You're one of the greatest running backs in the history of college football. Is there a game, a moment that stands out? The moment in the last bowl game when we were in Detroit. Motor and, City Bowl. Uh, the Motor City Bowl. And uh, Coach West wouldn't let me go in in the fourth quarter after we took the lead and they were coming back or what have you. And we ultimately ended up winning that game. But 
the moment when we dumped the ice on him and set in that this was my last collegiate game. Mm-hmm. And it stung so bad. I cried to the stadium that day through walkthrough. Uh, when we were going through the uh, pregame, I was crying. And I was like, I can't figure out why I'm crying. Like, <laughs> it, I didn't cry when we won the state championship my high school year. I didn't cry any that year. Or any the whole my whole high school career because I knew I was going on to play collegiate football, but I knew I had opportunity to play professional football. But that's just how much I knew that I was gonna miss the city of Memphis, the university, and the people that I've become to call friends. Must be a nice feeling to be known as the greatest player to ever play for the University of Memphis. I don't, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. <laughs> There's, There's a lot, lot of people up. that would say absolutely. Yeah. D'Angelo, we got you off the hot seat, but I want to ask you five quick questions. It's called Five for the Road. Just give me quick okay. answers. You can't say the Carolina Panthers. What is your favorite professional sports team? Favorite professional sports team? Hmm. <laughs> Memphis Grizzlies. So there you go. I was going to give you the hint on that. Favorite? athlete of all time favorite athlete of all time would have to be whose poster did you have on your wall did you have, i mean was there somebody when you were a kid that you emulated jerry rice jerry rice favorite musician rapper singer music group who do you listen to who's your That's favorite easy bob marley bob marley yeah just saw the tribute to bob marley the other night on one yeah. of the award shows might have been the grand listen to soft rock and reggae so i listen to is that that's the hairdo <laughs> yeah well it didn't come from the hair it's just like you know i'm it keeps the smile on my face favorite movie of all time favorite movie of all time texas chainsaw massacre the remake are you kidding me serious favorite tv show of all time favorite tv show of all time is spartacus love it yeah. D'Angelo, always great to see you. Thank you so much for being with us. No problem. And we'll be back with overtime right after this. Normally, ice in the Mid-South is not a likely pairing, unless it's in your glass of sweet tea. But if you look hard enough, you can find some. And when you do, you'll find the Ole Miss Rebels men's ice hockey team. The Ice Rebels is a team made up of passionate young men who pay over $1,000 apiece just to be a part of the show. There are no scholarships offered, just a chance to play hockey. This year, the Rebels qualified for the Nationals, which take place next week in Missouri. Quite an accomplishment. And earlier this week, I met up with the team at the Mid-South Ice House in Olive Branch and had a chance to chat with head coach Christian Sko to find out more about them. Christian, quite an accomplishment, uh, just the fourth year of existence for Ole Miss hockey, and you're going to the Nationals for the first time. Talk about achieving that. Well, it's something we're, we're very, very proud of. Um, like you said, it's our fourth year, and to come as far as we have as fast is really unheard of. Um, our first year, we had 11 skaters, and lost pretty much every game that year. But um, with help of, of good recruiting, uh, we really have brought in a lot of quality players, uh, especially from the known hockey area, St. Louis. Uh, we've got kids from Philadelphia area, from um, from up north where it's, where it's a lot more prevalent than down here. Exactly. And, and that really has helped us achieve the success we have. Um, it's a young team, so that also helps with they don't know that, oh yeah, we're not supposed to do this exactly, yet. Exactly, exactly. We play, we use that to our advantage. And this year, it, it all fell together. Uh, it was a tough road, but because guys really worked hard and they, they were rewarded for it, that's something I'm very, very happy for. You'll head up to Springfield, Missouri for the Nationals next week. Would winning the tournament and becoming the national champion, would that be a great upset? Are you expected to do well in this tournament? No, we weren't even expected to qualify. We, it would be a Cinderella story to say the least. Mm. Um, everything you read, we are expected to, to lose all three games handedly. Uh, but that's part of the fun, that's why you play the game. We were supposed to do that at our qualifying at, in regionals a couple of weeks ago. We were supposed to lose games there and still found a way to win. So as it would be a Cinderella story, we had the team, we had the talent. We'll just have to play the game and see how they work out. Tell me about your team. What, what makes them so successful this year? Is it more of a, a defensive-oriented group? Do they score a lot? Uh, tell me about them. 
We're very well rounded. We've got three great goaltenders that we can use, um, and we're very, very deep. We had some key injuries uh, at this within two weeks. We had one player out with a broken foot, one with a broken ankle, mm. one with an MCL tear, one with a dislocated shoulder. All four of them were players who normally played uh, significant minutes of ice time. Um, but because of our depth, we were able to weather the storm, come back the second semester, and, and really have a good second half of the season, which helped us get there. Uh, we're, because of our youth and the energy, uh, we're very fast. We score. Uh, our defense is is where we still need a little bit of work, but it's one of the biggest things that that has improved, especially from last year, which is one of the reasons we're more successful this year. Ice hockey is a club sport at Ole Miss. In fact, it's a club sport throughout the SEC, but just about everybody is the team, right? So, how many hoops do you got to jump through to get these guys on the ice to be able to deal with? classes and getting out of classes for the nationals because it's not a, a sanctioned sport with the school and it's just a club sport how hard is that it's very hard especially for for players they put in pretty much as much time as any varsity player does but they don't have some of the benefits they don't have the extra tutors they don't have the preferred scheduling as far as getting getting their classes first um it, it they have to balance out. They have to make sure they study while on the road. Uh, we do try to set up a um, study hall to make sure guys keep up their grades. Because even though we're a club sport, we are uh, still have to play under the ACHA, which is our governing body for club hockey in mm -hmm. the United States. And you still have to keep a minimum GPA requirement. You still have to be enrolled in a certain number of classes. And that's, that's a lot to deal with. It's... Uh, as far as leaving for games and stuff like that, it's all up to the teachers. Um, we've been fortunate that there hasn't been that many problems this year, but there have been a couple players that had to pick and choose which games to miss because of the, their accumulating too many absences. Your connection to this team, well, first of all, you, you helped create this team. Mm -hmm. But second of all, you're not from here. You're not from no. the States. Where are you from? Tell everybody your story and how you got connected with this team. I'm from Copenhagen, Denmark. I Grew up there, played hockey my whole life. Um, was fortunate to have success uh, playing there. Uh, my father was in the Danish military and was transferred to the U.S., which was my plane ticket, plane ticket over here. I then, as soon as the plane landed, I moved an hour away and played hockey there in Columbus, Ohio. Then played two years in Tupelo, Mississippi. And the team disbanded, and I ended, decided to to stay, start a family, uh, do normal everyday thing. Right. Uh, then heard heard buzz about Ole Miss starting a team, uh, and called the the head founder Cody Johnson um, when they were still in the, he was, he was still in the development phases. So um, Cody, I, and one of my assistant coaches, Colin, the three of us made it happen. Uh, put in a lot of hours over the summer, and we had a team. How do you find players? How do you recruit players? There are a couple websites, recruited websites. Um, we call and email pretty much every single high school league and junior league, which is a level you can play after high school. Uh, it doesn't interfere. You're not paid, so it doesn't interfere with your, your college eligibility. Mm -hmm. um, we recruit, we send, like I said, blanket emails and say, look, if you guys have any interest, please let us know. Uh, come down here, have a great college experience. We feel like we can offer one of the best college experiences in the country, and you can still play the sport that you love to, to play. Uh, we've got a great team. We've been, we've been successful fairly early on, um, and I think that helps. And we bring them to the campus, and usually if we can get them to campus, they're usually hooked. Uh, we bring them down. We don't bring them down in, in December when it's cold. We try to bring them down and in the spring we've got it it's coming up actually the week after nationals um, they'll be coming down and they get to see the campus and the scenery and they usually fall in love with it and if it's anything like sec football and baseball and basketball just as competitive we yes. wish you nothing but the best of the nationals it was great meeting you and great seeing the team thanks christian thank you
Last Saturday here on WKNO, the TSSAA Division II State Basketball Championships took place. In an All-Memphis final, Lausanne defeated ECS 67-43 to capture the Division II single-A title. Cameron Payne, the Murray State-bound senior, led the Lynx with 22 points. He would also capture a Mr. Basketball Award. In the D2 AA Championship, Briarcrest lost a heartbreaker to Nashville Endsworth 87-77 in overtime. The Saints led for most of the game, but Endsworth rallied behind star guard Corn Elder. For Briarcrest, future Memphis Tiger and Sports Files guest Austin Nichols went off for 42 points in his prep swan song, 28 coming in the first half. Nichols also was named a Mr. Basketball winner for a second straight year. Tomorrow, the Memphis Tigers men's hoop team will close out the regular season with a senior day tilt versus UAB at FedEx Forum. They'll try to finish the conference undefeated. Next week is the Conference USA Tournament in Tulsa, where Memphis will once again be the favorite. And next week on Sports Files, I'll bring in several members of the media to toss around questions concerning the Tigers, including expectations for the postseason. And that'll do it for now. Remember, you can see more TSSAA championship games Saturday right here on WKNO. And we'll see you next time.